Hello again, fellow audiophiles. I am Wave Theory, and I am back today to do a re-review, if you will, of the Odyssey Carbon, the name styled CRBN. This is a 4,500 US dollar open back around the ear electrostatic headphone. I originally reviewed this unit back in the spring of 2022, and I will link to my video for that in the description below. The reason for the re-review here, I think, is twofold. One, I think it's cool to come back after some time has passed and review some things that I've already done before. And I got a really interesting opportunity to do that because tastes change, we grow, we learn uh, as we go through this hobby, which really is a journey. And so did that happen here? Okay, did, uh, do I still like the same things I liked about this the first time around? Dislike the same things that I've disliked about it the first time around and so forth. So we're going to answer that question. Now, how it came into my possession is because originally I was reviewing the LTA, the Linear Tube Audio Z10E, electrostatic headphone energizer, headphone amplifier, and speaker amp all in one unit. And that one came a little bit ahead of schedule. So I was caught a little bit flat-footed, didn't have any Estat headphones in-house at the time. And with LTA's help, Odyssey really stepped up and they sent this to me for a re-review and to listen to the LTA on. So a review of the Z10e is forthcoming in the not too distant future, I hope. Okay, and a big thanks to Odyssey for sending this out so that I could um, listen to eStats on it. In the meantime, I also was sent to the Hi-Fi Min Shangri-La Junior system, right? So uh, the both the headset and the energizer for that. So I heard this on that energizer as well. And also the uh, Hi-Fi Min sent me, you can see it here. There it is, the Shangri-La Senior, which I had around to uh, test those things on as well. But this video will be about the carbon. And uh, we'll go ahead and do shameless self-promotion here, and then we'll come back on the other side. I have a couple more disclaimers and explanations about what's going on in this video. And then of course, we'll jump into the review. So let's do that. Hey, thanks for watching this video. Please remember to hit that like button. And if you haven't, please subscribe. Also, I have a Patreon set up so that you can help support me on a monthly basis. And I've set up a PayPal donation so that you can help me out in that way too if a monthly dis a subscription does not make sense for you. Links for all of that, including the benefits in the description below. Please check those out. All right, on with the show. All right, so those disclaimers, that was an interesting statement. You're probably curious about that. So as I said, this was loaned to me uh, by Odyssey, and I will be sending it back here shortly, so I'm not keeping it or anything like that. Um, the only request that Odyssey made of me when I reviewed this was that they get to review the review ahead of time and uh, screen it for technical accuracy. Uh, on the subjective stuff, they promised to not make any uh, requests or ask me to change anything and just let me say my piece on that. And so I did that. I shot a video originally and I sent them that and um, they had a couple of comments on some technical things that I said uh, in the original video, but true to their word, they asked me to change nothing about the subjective parts and in truth, asked me to change nothing about even the technical stuff. They just, uh, I actually had a phone call with the owner of, I believe he's the owner, Mark Cohen okay, of Odyssey. Um, he called me and we had a very pleasant chat, which was a bit alarming at first when you get a call from the owner of a company because you always think you screwed up initially. But it ended up being a very pleasant conversation and just became two nerds talking about audio stuff, um, which was fun. Okay, And he just answered some questions and responded to some statements that I made about technical things on this headphone and about their approach to equalization. Um, so, uh, but even at that, he never asked me to actually change anything. I, on my own, decided to come back and reshoot the intro parts of this video, including what I am saying right now. So this is in preparation for all of you out there watching to know that this video is going to, going to look a couple of different ways at a couple of different moments because I originally shot a review, sent it to Odyssey, had that really interesting conversation with Mark Cohen and then came back and decided that I do want to um, include some of the thoughts that he shared with me 
to be fair and to be complete, and then also to put it out there for the audiophile community to digest and think about. So, I'm going to show you that review that I sent to Odyssey that is untouched with the exception of me jumping back in um, from this shooting to uh, explain further some comments that I make in there. Okay, so that's the only change that I've made. And again, Odyssey did not ask me to make those changes. It was my decision to do that. They were, other than answering my questions in a very helpful and pleasant way, they really have allowed me to say my piece on this. All right, so let's get into it. And again, I will cut in here and there to uh, flesh out some points more fully after my conversation with Mark. Here we go. Okay, Odyssey Carbon, and yes, that is a new background behind me uh, that may have distracted some of you. Those blue acoustic panels that I had back there were starting to fade and get dirty, so I just swept them under a rug, okay? Got a little bit new background that has waves on it, which seems very on brand. All right, so back to the Carbon. So this is still listing on Odyssey's website for 4,500 US dollars. All right, so the pricing has not changed since the spring of 2022 when I uh, was loaned and reviewed this the first time. And I'm not going to spend a ton of time going through uh, all of the build and the features and all of that again because I've already done that and it's the same headphone, so all of that is the same. Okay, um, and so as far as fit and build and finish and all of that goes, I mean, I think it's still a nice looking headphone. I like the, the uh, geometric design that kind of looks like a, a perspective of three-dimensional cubes looked at on, on one of the vertices right there, and then with the, the gray slash silvery screen pattern back behind it. Gives it a nice accent, okay? Looks nice. Um, it is fairly comfortable with a fair amount of ear area there inside of the, the pad. So, I, I went back and watched my first video and I didn't have a whole lot of comfort complaints other than maybe it does clamp a little bit on the hard side for some um, and that's that's still generally true there. But otherwise, like I'm not going to go over the build and all of that again. Um, I did ask Odyssey about why Estats have attached cables um, because I know with Dynamics and with Planar Magnetics, it's very common even for Odyssey to have detachable cables here, so you can swap out cables, anything like that. Well, the rep that I talked to didn't know for sure, but said something that I find very believable, and he says he thinks that it's just to reduce the risk of electrostatic shock um, by plugging these in and out. Now, why might that be? Uh, well, the way E-STATs work is the, uh, the membrane inside of there holds a constant electric charge on it. Right, so electrostats, um, as I've said before, they do not use any magnetic fields in there to uh, produce and control driver motion. It's all electric field. So what there is is this constant charge put on the membrane there, and then that membrane is there's probably um, uh, is probably much like planar magnetics, where planar magnetics can have magnets on either one or both sides of the membrane. Okay, I think with most E-STATs, there's a, what they call, I think it's a stator, okay? But basically, um, a metal plate with perforations or something of that on either side of this membrane. And that's where they vary the voltage, positive or negative, to get the membrane inside to move back and forth. Okay, why does that matter for attached cables? Well, that, uh, that membrane in there that carries the constant charge holds a fairly high charge on it. Like it, it holds a fairly high amount of energy on it. And so at the amp end, it's pretty safe to pl uh, plug and unplug this because we have these somewhat large connectors here with this five pin style connector. So it's uh, you know not a lot of risk of arcing or anything like that. And you know, grounding it out, it's okay. You're not really gonna damage much at this end. But on this end, here to go into the headphone where pins and, and electric connectors and all of that are going to be smaller. The higher the charge gets and then the smaller the pins get and the closer they have to get together, the more risk there is of like bending one up slightly and then getting charge to discharge across and short things out where you don't want it to and things of that nature. So that made sense to me 
And so I think I can forgive eStats in general for having attached cables, uh, usually. And Odyssey's attached cable here works pretty well. Like, it doesn't have much memory. It doesn't tangle very easily. It's round, mostly round, maybe oval-shaped a little bit, okay, in its... Um, and its design here, which stands out because like the shangs here, here's the hi-fi men, like this is like a flat ribbon style uh, cable there. The senior has the same kind of thing. It's kind of flat ribbony right there where this one is a little bit more round slash oval shaped, okay? Um, which is neither here nor there. It's just a little bit different, but it works pretty well and it's generally long enough that you can slide back from the energizer a fair distance without stretching it out uh, or anything like that, but uh, it's also like not gonna reach across a room if you need it to do that. Okay, the other thing that I remember specifically about the carbon from like a, a usability standpoint is there is just a lot of driver crinkle in this one. And I noticed that on this unit again too, is like uh, particularly after music plays and then you pause it, when, you, when I would go to take it off of my head, I would hear driver crinkle a lot, okay? So it's one of the, the noisier headphones in that regard. Um, that's, I don't think that's really a problem. It's just something that you might be a bit alarmed at if you're not expecting it. Like the, there's a lot of driver crinkle in this one, okay? I've had two units now, both of them have done that. So I think that's just a thing in their design. Okay, jumping in here uh, with the new shoot because uh, Mark Cohen talked about that driver crinkle issue with me that I just mentioned. And he says that the source for that is that the membrane, the driver membrane inside here, which is that part of the driver again that carries the constant electric charge, is actually placed very close to the stators. Okay, and then the stators are those perforated plates or conductors on either side of that uh, statically charged membrane where the voltage varies to move that membrane. So the space between that membrane and those stators is very, very small. And so the driver crinkle that is heard is that any slight change in pressure, air pressure, either inside or outside of the headphone is going to push that driver into the stator. And that's the crinkling sound that you're hearing is that really thin membrane getting pushed into those metal conductive plates. All right, um, Mr. Cohen says that um, those are common issues uh, with electrostats. And that may be true, but I also have to say that of the e-stats that I have used, which is the Stax 009, Stax 009S from the previous time that I, I played around with e-stats, and then this one, and you know the Shangri-La Senior, the Shangri-La Junior, which is just off of the, the frame here. Okay, um, the Carbon, both models that I've had have um, had this driver crinkle happen much more than any of those. And by much more, I mean, I can't remember a time when any of those other units did driver crinkle, okay? Um, so I don't know that it has anything to do with how I'm placing my hands when I put it on and take it off, because usually, with any headphone, I kind of tend to grab it right here by the, I think this is called the gimbal, right? Grab it there, okay, and take it off like that with pretty much every headphone. And this one is far and away the most driver crinkliest headphone of any type that I have used, okay? Now, again, I want to emphasize, I don't think that is actually a problem. Um, I, it's, uh, it's just one of those things that I just think you need to know about ahead of time um, in case you spend $4,500 and then hear this thing make a lot of noise like that, uh, it could be alarming. Again, I don't think it's a problem. It does not make any excess noise or anything while music is playing. It's only when I put, the, put it on or take it off that that happens. Okay, so that was one cut in. Let's get back to the original review. Okay, so with that, let me come back to the sound on the carbon then. When I originally reviewed the Carbon again back in the spring of 2022, which I will link to down below, my review, not the spring, okay? Uh, I, rem I only had one Energizer at the time, and that was the Molnir Carbon. This time around, as I mentioned in the intro, I had the LTA Z10E on hand and the uh, Hi-Fi Men Shangri-La Junior Energizer to try this with. 
So those are both vacuum tube designs, okay? And so uh, that produced a bit of a different sound and at least two different flavors of sound to try this one on too. All right, um, and then as far as other signal chain gear goes there, I still have my Berkeley um, Audio Designs Alpha Series 2 DAC, which for the most part was fed by a Singer SU2 digital to digital converter, which is connected via USB to my desktop PC. I did, however, in the course of this review period, I uh, uh, got into Rune. And so I've been using that for, um, I think, about 10 days now before I started shooting this. Started playing around with it some, where I got um, a, a little NUC or NUC for, to run their Rock uh, OS, and then just using my computer as a, uh, a remote, and then I have a, uh, an iFi Neo Stream they're feeding the Berkeley via SPDIF, okay, coax SPDIF. Um, so also reviewed this with that signal chain as well. Okay, uh, and sound impressions, again, I, I went back and watched my previous review and I don't think I need to change a ton, to be honest with you. There's a lot of resolution here. I think that the resolution is definitely $4,500 price tag worthy. Um, it's got a very fast sound. It has a decent amount of physicality to it. Like there's some good punch and slam down in the low end. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, the tuning, like it's, it's still a distinctly Odyssey sound. So even though this is Odyssey's first and only that I know of Estat headphone, um, it still very much sounds like an Odyssey in terms of its tuning and its presentation. Um, so I've not heard the entirety of, L of Odyssey's line, but I have heard, oh, I'll just list them for you, LCD2 prephaser, LCD3 prephaser, Legacy LCDX, LCDX 2021 open, LCDX 2021 closed, um, LCD5, LCDR, and this one. Okay. Oh, MM500. And this one. So what is that? Nine? Okay. Nine LCD models I have either owned, borrowed for an extended period of time, or reviewed. And I will link to all the ones I have reviews for down below. Okay. So when I say this has the LCD house sound, I do, feels kind of like I know what I'm talking about there. So what does that mean? The uh, the tuning, you get pretty good extension. There's really good low bass extension here. There's pretty good upper frequency reaching up into the air frequencies as well. The air frequencies are not elevated, nor really is the sub bass. They're fairly neutrally tuned there. There is a little bit of above neutral mid-range presence here. Okay, uh, it, for the most part, um, I, there are some, uh, some frequency response graph curve graphs out there on the web and that this will bear that out where these fairly closely follow Harmon through the ear gain region but there is a bit of a, a bump around one kilohertz that does bring vocals and some mid-range instruments forward a little bit um, and that's pretty common with Odyssey is they do like their mid-range presence and bump that range up frequently or they'll put a spike at three kilohertz or something like that, like they did on the MM500 to really bring some mid-range presence and push those kinds of things forward. So a lot of listeners, I think, like that and they like the increased presence. They like the focus on vocals and having them stand out a little bit more. So if that applies to you, then this is a good option still. Um, I think that does have an adverse impact, not a huge one, but a little bit on its staging capability. Uh, so it is a large, but not necessarily, this one here, the carbon, it is a large, but not necessarily huge sound stage, sound stage -er. Um But the issue that I run into is like with that stock tuning and that kind of around 1K push forward a little bit, the coherence of the imaging and the separation to my ears, okay, so that caveat in there too, is not particularly competitive with similarly priced models like the Shang Jr., okay, or the Stax headphones that I had at the same time that I had this one, or even non-Estats, Planars, like, um, 
like the, uh, why am I drawing a blank? The, the HE1000 SE, high five in HE1000 SE, or Susvara. I realize Susvara is a little bit more expensive yet. Okay, not a ton. You can get Susvara for 45 to 5K with, without, without a whole lot of different, a whole lot of uh, challenge there. Okay, and so, yeah, that's a, that's a tuning choice that Odyssey made that you ha which had a little bit of that unfortunate consequence. Now, I also know that Odyssey as a brand uh, leans into equalization hard. They have that, um, what do they call it? Reveal EQ. They have Reveal EQ, which has a bunch of presets for a lot of the headphones in their range. And they have leaned into using that in... Uh, <clears throat> in a fairly big way to to clean up some of that last little bit of tuning that they sometimes have. And I've heard their Reveal EQ presets make huge differences. Like with the Legacy LCDX, it made a huge difference. Um, and, and that sort of thing. Now, there is a preset, at least in Rune, because I said I'm a new Rune user, that the Rune equalization has a carbon preset in it. And so I enabled that and I tried it here. It did pull that mid-range forwardness back into closer to true neutral uh, for me than the stock tuning. That did increase the staging or the imaging and the separation coherence okay, of the presentation here. It did not catch the Shang Jr. or the other Hi-Fi men um, uh, Planar's HE1000SE, the Susvara that I have on hand. I also have an OG Utopia dynamic driver on hand. It did not catch any of those in terms of its the the holography of being able to image and separate with you know just really 3D uh, soundstage. And that's because I still think the mid range there was just a little bit too far forward, which again caused vocals and some pianos and stringed instruments and things like that to stand out a little bit, almost like push them towards me a little bit, okay, which really kind of hurt some of the depth in the, uh, the imaging there. Okay, um, an example where this really came out was Duel of the Fates by John Williams, like in that one, and there is video on YouTube where you can go and check this. You've got like the, the semicircular arrangement of the orchestra right in front of you, and then behind them and on risers, you've got a full choir. And <clears throat> this did not pull out that depth or really position the choir behind the instrumentation, kind of more brought it up into where it sounded like it was like almost on top of the instrumentation, okay, in the way that this one could, or HE1000SE, or Sasvara, or even Utopia could do. So, the resolution here, excellent. The physicality, okay, the, the uh, <laughs> like the punch, the slam, okay, uh, and like the snap of snare drums and all of that, like so the, the macro dynamics and all of that here are really good and among the best I've heard of the e-stats that I've heard. Okay, it's, it's really quite up there on that one. Um, I think the stock tuning needs a little bit of work the presence of the, the carbon preset there that exists, you know, from Odyssey, I think indicates that they also realize that. That's my interpretation anyway. Um, and it does help, but in terms of the, the overall spatial presentation, it still just doesn't quite catch the competition. All right, another big part of the conversation that I had with Mark Cohen was about this equalization business. And this was a really interesting and fascinating part of the conversation, I thought, because, I mean, you just heard me make the, the claim in the original video here that Odyssey is a company that, uh, a company that leans heavily into equalization. And I still think that that is true um, because I cannot name another headphone maker that has developed their own custom software equalization system and then offered that for sale as a separate product um, then Odyssey. Okay, they're the only ones that I know of who have done that. Now, what Mr. Cohen was focusing on in this part of the conversation here 
was that, and, and I'm probably guilty of this too, not probably, I am guilty of this too, is that he was talking about there is an attitude or a belief that exists there out there within our hobby where a lot of audiophiles seem to think that the frequency response that you get from Odyssey headphones while using their Reveal EQ system, okay, which has the same presets in Rune, I believe, which is what I was using for this one, that that represents what these headphones are supposed to sound like, that that is the correct tuning, so to speak. And he really wanted to make clear that he does not see it that way. He does see the way that these headphones, his headphones, come off the factory line and come out of the box with break-in, of course. Okay, um, that whatever stock tuning you get without any kind of equalization is the way the headphone is supposed to sound. He sees the Reveal EQ system and those presets as being more targeted towards pro audio users. And as I understood the conversation, those equalization presets there within Reveal or again in Rune are there for professionals to homogenize their listening experience from person to, to person. So from professional to professional. Meaning that with the EQ engaged, he feels that he can more uh, comfortably guarantee that those professional users in two different places are getting the same listening experience regardless of which Odyssey headphone they are using. And that way they can clear up communication between themselves if they are collaborating on a mix or anything of that nature. So just to kind of repeat that quickly, and hopefully clearly the the who uh, i believe mr cohen is the owner okay of odyssey is saying that he doesn't see odyssey's reveal eq presets as being the correct sound for their headphones they are a tool that he is targeting at professionals so that audio pros have a more uniform and homogenous way to communicate to each other about mixes, masters, etc. using Odyssey headphones. And then also those uh, equalization presets are designed to aid in the ability to transfer those mixes out, okay? So that whatever mix or um, master or whatever that has come up with on an Odyssey headphone with the Reveal EQ preset in place will transfer the experience, the listening experience will transfer to a wide range of contexts on a wide range of listening systems for a wide range of users, okay? Be they listening in a car with the cheap earbuds that come with a smartphone, okay? Or a high-end headphone setup that may or may not have Odyssey headphones in it, or even a 2.2 channel or 2.1 channel speaker system. Now, he went on to say that if the end user, so people who I see my target audience as, is just someone who is listening for their own pleasure, if any of those users like the Reveal EQ presets and improves the and they improve the listening experience for those people, then he's all for people using it in that way too. It's just he does not see that as the correct tuning, so to speak. Now, there's probably going to be a lot of commentary on that in the in the comment section below. And I hope there is, actually, because I think that is a really rich and fascinating area of conversation. And I'm also going to say that I'm still processing a lot of what he told me in that conversation. And I, while I um, probably am guilty, not probably again, while I am guilty of being one of those who thought that the Reveal EQ presets were the correct tuning, um, I am willing to rethink that and reconsider it and uh, have been mulling it a lot. So. I don't think I am done on this topic either, okay? Um, not only on equalization at large, but on the role of a system like Reveal EQ and what it plays 
within our um, audio hobby for either professionals or especially for consumers. Okay, so um, I need more time to think about that. I may very well talk to Mr. Cohen again, we'll see, and uh, ask him some more questions. Um, but I don't think I'm done with this. I don't have a specific plan yet, but I do think at some point in the future, I'm gonna come back to this topic in another video and have more to say about it in some form. Again, I just need to do some thinking about what that is. All right, so I think that clears up a lot of the conversation that I had with Mark Cohen. So uh, we will jump back into the uh, original review from here. Now, that said, there's still going to be a lot of people who really like this headphone. They're going to appreciate the increased vocal presence and that sort of thing. Okay. Um, and if that's you, I, I mean, yeah, it's a really good headphone. It's got excellent resolution. It's got fun dynamics to it. Okay. Um, the timbre, even with that mid range bump, isn't terrible. It's got good treble timbre, got pretty good bass texturing and all of that. So, I mean, there are a lot of good strengths here. If it were my $4,500, I don't think that I would aim it in this direction. I would probably go here if I needed Estat, yeah, or wanted to go Estat with that money, okay? So, um, yeah, I'm going to leave it there. I will do a more thorough comparison between these two when I get around to the full review of this one. Okay, uh, because again, I, I focused a lot of more time on with on this one than this one so far. So I need to get into this one, listen a little bit more, even though the staging differences that I just talked about are quite clearly noticeable right out of the gate um, with this one here. And neither of these are anywhere near that one. That's in a whole other league of its own. I don't even know how I'm going to review that one because I don't know how... <laughs> what something on that level is even supposed to sound like really other than better than everything that's come before it okay um <clears throat> which it does more on that later okay uh so yeah that's we'll just leave it there um this for a first foray of for a company into a new headphone type Okay, um, this is a lot of positives here. I think it's a good base to build on going forward. My personal preference would be that Odyssey just chill out a little bit on the mid-range tuning. And again, it's not just this headphone. They do this all over their line. And it does have an adverse impact on the overall uh, imaging and separation and ability to create a holographic 3D sound stage or an, you know spatial presentation that is being done by a lot of their competition. And so I would encourage them to like look into that because you've got the resolution, you've got the dynamics, okay? Um, and, and, and that sort of thing. So uh, yeah, we'll leave it there. I'm Wave Theory. This has been my re-review of the Odyssey Carbon. Thanks for watching. Please give a like if you haven't yet. Subscribe if you haven't yet. Give me a comment down below. Please check out my PayPal, my Patreon, and do all of those things that you do to support YouTube channels. Thanks for watching, and as always, enjoy the music.